are listening to the Slash and Cast Podcast Network. Enjoy the show. <laughs> hey folks, Justin here with a quick word before we dive into this episode. This episode features myself and Angelique, and we chat with actor Simon Bamford, who you may be familiar with from the first two Hellraiser films and Nightbreed. You may know him as Butterball. We chat about Clive Barker, Hellraiser, Nightbreed Theater, Peter Vincent and Fright Night, and much more. Also, please keep in mind, this was recorded several months ago. So when we're discussing Hellraiser, this was prior to the announcement and filming of Hulu's Hellraiser project. So without further ado, you've opened the box. Here you go. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Take us back in time when you were a kid. What sort of films and fiction and music were you into that kind of got your creative juices flowing? That's a good question. That's, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know if you're aware of them over in the States, but there was a, a writer called Enid Blyton who did a lot of kids stuff. So they were the kind of the earliest. So she wrote the a series of books called The Famous Five and The Famous Magnificent Seven or something seven. And they were kind of adventure stories for, for kids. And I suppose they were the first kind of things that I read or kind of got into when I was really young and then as I got older obviously I met Clive so I was very into Clive's work I was very into Stephen King so I'm that generation Peter Straub uh, all the kind of the horror classics really now and when did you get involved in theater was that always something you were doing when you were a kid one of my headmasters when I was really young was very into writing his own plays so he kind of encouraged us to do that so I did some really dreadful dreadful the kind of plays that parents have to sit through did and then tell their kids how wonderful they were <laughs> So I did quite a lot though. My parents were were saints. They were martyrs to the cause. <laughs> So yeah, they were the kind of the first things that really got me hooked on theatre and just interested. It was it was fun to be applauded at the end. So I uh, kind of I think most kids that's what they really kind of get off on. And then later on, I joined a kind of local group, and then there was a really good theatre in the nearest city to me that really did some excellent excellent uh, professional theatre that went a lot of it went straight into the West End. And I was lucky enough to get a job as a as an usher front of house there and kind of work my way through to backstage. I was on the stage door so I saw an awful lot of productions there and I, I learned an awful lot from just watching those people and seeing what they were doing that's great did you have any favorite roles to play back then I enjoyed doing Shakespeare I, did, <laughs> I, did a, the, I don't know if you, ever, if you remember Joseph from the amazing technical dream coats I'm not familiar so it's a kind of Andrew Lowe Weber Tim Rice thing it was one of the very first things they did my local group did a version to kind of compete with that and it was called the prodigal son and yeah I was playing the prodigal son and the prodigal son and it was a musical and they actually did uh, make a record of it I have it I've got a huge collection of vinyl here and I do have a copy of it and it is absolutely dreadful <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's under lock and key just oh, in case hilarious. I ever get burgled I would hate that ever to get out anywhere to <laughs> anybody to ever hear it <laughs> but my, my dad was in it as well he was oh was that uh, uh. Oh, it's a good thing to have, though. You know, at the time, it was really amazing. So, so I mean, you were just mentioned that you have a huge vinyl collection. So what kind of music were you into growing up? Um, we were talking about this the other day, actually. So the Moody Blues was one of the first kind of things that I really loved. Uh, Nights in White Satin. Uh, it's kind of, again, that kind of era of stuff. Mm -hmm. Patti Smith, because the night when I was growing up, she was, uh, I think she was kind of edgy. And there weren't that many female singers who were edgy at that time. It was kind mm -hmm. of over here. It was kind of Lulu and you know, they were kind of soft pop. Whereas Because the Night, Patti Smith was a bit more kind of rock and roll. And, and there weren't that many women doing that. ZZ Top. Mm. I'm, I've always had quite a big love of music generally. So I can flip from one genre to the other. The only one, because of my age, I've just turned 60. And the only one that I, I see as my kind of generation leap was uh, rap. I, I am the generation that don't get rap. Uh, <laughs> I know rap's quite kind of old school now. Now, but I, I was the generation I just don't get this as music you know uh, which is a terrible thing to say but, uh... <laughs> 
It's just so everybody's got their preferences. <laughs> Now, I know your uh, some of your co-stars like Nicholas and Barbie were also involved in theater. Did you ever have any run-ins with them before Hellraiser? When I was 17, I went to drama school in London. I was in the same year as Nick, Nick Vince, who plays Chatterer. So we did a lot of stuff there together. We did a, a production of a, a German classic play called Spring Awakening, an author called Vedekind. It's a really amazing piece about censorship and how censorship can be a really bad thing. But it was written turn of the century, so it was way ahead of its time. But Nick and I had a, a couple of scenes in that and it was it was controversial. It was a really controversial play at the National Theatre at the time in London called Romans in Britain. They had like a buggery scene. They had a lot of naked men on stage and there was a, like a buggery scene in this. People were up in arms about it. And, and so uh, at drama school, they thought, oh, this is good. We'll get some publicity. So they decided that they would have a similar thing in this production of Spring Awakening. So yeah, we had a shower scene and there was like a masturbation scene in it. It was like, yeah, when, when, you're, when you're 17, 18 it's like okay this is cool i'll do it but then when your parents come to see it, it's like okay this is slightly awkward <laughs> <laughs> they had the two right guys for the job <laughs> <laughs> yeah looking back oh that was uh, so yeah we, we did we did a few things together at drama school barbie i didn't know barbie until we did hellraiser 2 but doug pinhead i did i did meet because in my final year i did a production of king lear which is where clive barker and then some of the dog company who lived nearby and they were like a fringe theater company they came to see it and they were looking for new people to join and they liked what i did so, so they asked to meet me afterwards so that's how i got to meet them and so i did get to know doug and and clive just as just as i was finishing drama school and um when when i left one of the my first jobs was was with kind of touring britain and the netherlands how long did you stay on with clive just as an actor we did about four or five months I think maybe, maybe longer maybe six months we, we got to a point where because it was fringe theatre uh, it was like profit share so all of the profit was supposed to be shared amongst the cast and the technical crew but Clive's ideas were always so big that all the profits tended to get put back into the next production and the, the special effects and there was loads of stuff that we were doing we did a production called Frankenstein in Love where, where the early seeds of Hellraiser were being planted you could see looking back you could see exactly where his brain was going and we had a skinned man in that Oliver Parker was also in the, in the in the group. He's quite a big film director now. And he was the, the removals man in Harry's 1 and 2. And he was also Polinsky in Nightbreeze. Uh, so he had a full body suit made up with him looking like he's had his, his skin flayed off him. So obviously there were kind of lots of things like that. But special effects like that where you have no budget costs a lot of money. So all the profit went back into those. So after a while, we all realized that if we wanted to take our art and our jobs as actors seriously, we needed to make a living from it and we weren't making a living from the dog company so the company was sadly disbanded and we all went our own way and for a while I did some commercial theatre some of which was absolute terrible absolute twat theatre it was awful 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 and I did a couple of productions like that and I thought I'm ripping I felt like I was ripping the audience off because it was so bad I got to a point I thought if I don't get if, if the next job isn't any good I'm gonna have to give up because I don't think I can carry on doing this awful shitty stuff and thankfully I got a, I got a production of Jesus Christ Soups which was a Around at the time which was hugely successful and ended up doing a, a, a big it was in repertory theatre but we ended up doing one of the first tours in the UK of it so we toured that for months and months and months and it was it was brilliant we had standing ovations every night so I can thank that production for keeping me in it and then I did a load of stuff for a few years and then I just rang I had a, a little break as you do as an actor and I rang Clive just to see what he was up to he said he was just putting together he just a screenplay for Rawhead Rex and another film but he wasn't very happy with the way it had kind of turned out so he persuaded the production company to let him write and direct the next one and he uh, we were just chatting on the phone and he said do you want to partner and I went yeah that'd be cool thinking it would just be a kind of little film that nobody would ever see but it would be kind of useful experience to do some film work and, and that was Hellraiser so you can never tell you can never mm -hmm. tell that's really cool you just mentioned several people that knew Clive and worked with him prior to those films and that's an uh -huh. aspect that stands out you know he targets his friends for roles in the movie did that familiarity help you on said at all would you say that helped your performance yes y yes yes and no in some ways it was lovely being on set and obviously seeing Clive there but it was also Clive's first time as a as a, as a kind of proper director uh, film director so he'd <laughs> he'd read a lot of books or he'd been to the library he tells a story he'd been to the library to find a, a book on how to direct film because he'd never done it he didn't know what to do and the internet wasn't around at the time and the only book they'd got
Dutch was was out on loan, so he couldn't even couldn't even read that. So he was kind of making it up as he went along, but he, he learned very quickly. So he was learning. He was short talking to everybody he was meeting and learning from them. But when we were first, especially when we were first on set, there was there was Clive who was new to it all. There was myself. There was Ollie. There was Doug. And there was Nick. Oh, was anybody else from there? But we, it was all our first time, and a lot of the other people on the crew they'd been doing it. Everybody was fairly new to it, but most of them had done at least you know two or three films before then so they were kind of pretty much okay so he's brought his friends in you know let's just see if they can actually do this and certainly when we got to the, the first takes on how Razor, the first time they actually got us on set doug uh, no nick and i both had no eye holes in our makeup so we were completely blind doug had black contact lenses and the sets were very very dark and gloomy mm-hmm. and so pretty much the three of us were blind so doug could see a little bit so um he could kind of but when when um, and then the message didn't quite get through that we were we were blind and also my, my makeup had was really thick and covered my ears so I couldn't really hear that well either so when they first said action we Nick, Nick and I just walked off in completely the wrong direction no, Doug virtually kind of went to where it was be but completely overshot his mark because he couldn't see it and there was this kind of murmuring on set and you could think you, and they thought oh shoot you know we've got a load, load of tons of and look at these guys that don't know what they're doing yeah these <laughs> shit actors what were we going to do with them you know, this is terrible can we recast at this stage you know you could feel the atmosphere but as 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 it went on and they realized that you know there was actually a physical problem that we needed to sort out it got warmer and but obviously by the time it was pretty much the same crew who went on to do Hellraiser 2 and then went on to do Nightbreed so by the time we got to Nightbreed we all knew each other we trusted each other we knew shorthand for what we needed to get uh, achieved so but to start with they were I think yeah they were they were quite stressful times <laughs> <laughs> How much did you know about the role going into Hellraiser? Did you know you were going to have to spend so much time in makeup? Ah, uh, he, he, Clive said there might be a little bit of makeup involved. We, we, we I went down to Pinewood where Image Animation, the, the makeup studios were based, and I did do. I had a life cast done, but then really didn't. You know, they showed a few pictures, and I thought, well, okay. And then we went back to do some screen tests of the makeup, and that was when I realised that it was going to be pretty intense an experience putting it on, but even then they really only just put it on me filmed me kind of turning my head took it off me so I I had no idea then what the actual reality of a day's shooting was going to be which was getting there at some crazy time in the morning getting picked up in the middle of the night getting there really early for me it was probably one of the easiest ones I had a bowl cap glued to my head my hair all greased down so that it didn't stick to the hair and then they made my mouth up black and that became a running joke that they didn't tell me about so it was just so that you couldn't see me through the mouth of the makeup so they made my mouth black but it became a running joke and I didn't find this out until until like years and years and years later that every time I came in they put more black makeup so there are there are pictures out there so like from here down I'm like black makeup and black makeup is is pretty shit to get off to be honest because it was it was the days of Leishner grease stick makeup so it was the joke was on me <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the the head was one piece which they it took it was obviously skin tight inside so it took three of them to kind of force it down over my head and there would be a, a point where it would completely seal my mouth and my nose and I was got there and thought just keep calm keep calm they will get past <laughs> this point because I couldn't breathe at that point and then they would get it on and that's when I realized claustrophobic it was going to be because I couldn't see I couldn't really hear I couldn't breathe through my nose because there's no air holes there were no nose holes in the makeup and then just before then they get the, the body on which was fiberglass like a bell the kind of the shell of the body on it and the gash in the stomach so that would go on and then they put the leather costume on and then you'd have to be kind of it was like a kind of corset type thing so you'd have to be kind of laced into that and then they put the rest of it and I couldn't do anything I was blind so and then they would dip my hands in in bowls of blood just before each take and i do still have my original hellraiser script and it's got blood stains on the on the pages from where i was trying to get to the right page and then the very final thing they made molds of my teeth and they had these disgusting false teeth which kind of went on top of mine glued on top of mine so then they 
they were they were kind of glued on and then there it was and I would, was led like a blind man if I needed to go to the toilet at that point I would have to be led there and I would have to feel the porcelain to work out where I was aiming <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't good it was humiliating experience and then they uh, they finally originally worked out that they would point us in the right direction Nick and I and there would be a, like a draft excluder on the floor where they wanted me to stop where the mark was and then one action we kind of shuffle forward slowly until we could feel this with our feet and then we'd know we'd reach the mark and then if they wanted us to turn 30 degrees to the right or whatever then we wanted to do them that's what we do so it was kind of acting by numbers really so how much time were you looking at in makeup from beginning to end so we'd be in makeup kind of four in the morning the final kind of bits would be put on normally about eight then most days we'd sit and wait for hours and hours and hours and hours and some days they never got to us the green room would be full of four centibytes sitting miserably around and this horrendous makeup there was there was <laughs> one day and they kept saying it later it'll be a bit later oh it'll be after lunch we'll get to you after lunch uh, we think we're going to get to you after tea i know there was there's at least one day where we sat there from eight in the morning till eight at night and then they came in and said sorry we're not actually get to get to your scenes oh you're going to get to these scenes i didn't spend six hours in this for nothing yeah well 12 12 hours 12 hours of sensory deprivation <laughs> sitting in the dark with your own thoughts you can't even read a book because you can't see or a newspaper you can't talk to people because you can't talk you can't really hear them anyway there was one day when i i got really miserable in, in the in the costume and the makeup and I, I actually started to cry it was so claustrophobic i cannot oh, tell no. you how it was but it was nobody nobody realized <laughs> <laughs> Thought. So I've always said that the, the line, it's uh, no tears, it's a waste of good suffering, kind of applied to me. <laughs> <laughs> Clive wrote that in for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clive was great. He didn't understand. There was one day he, he came in with a bottle of Jack Daniels and a straw. It was the early days of those kind of prosthetics. So they didn't, they believed that if we had too much greasy food, it might melt the glue and the prosthetics was fall out. That was the other terrible thing. We'd be there at four in the morning and about eight in the morning, you'd smell the lovely, the, the catering van and you'd smell the cooked eggs and the bacon and we weren't allowed to have it. We could have orange juice. <laughs> So of the four of you guys, which one would you say drew the short stick in terms of makeup? I think probably me and Nick, to be honest. I think our, our experiences were pretty similar. I, I would say we were we were level pegging. We were we were drawing on that. <laughs> but although at least he could do something with his teeth. The very first day in the makeup on set, I sat in the green room or in the makeup chairs with Doug because I wanted to work out what I could make the makeup do, how I could make it move and what it would look like when I did certain things inside of it. He sat there and I, I, I started moving my face a little bit and kind of you know just doing stuff and and he was telling me how it looked so I, I started just kind of doing small raising the eyebrows or moving my face a little bit and he said so let, let me know when you're going to start uh, oh okay so <laughs> I said well I, ha I had started but so I, I did kind of bigger things with my, with my face inside the mask and he went nope nothing so a few minutes later I was kind of yearning you know <laughs> inside the mask and he went nope it's not moving <laughs> but ah oh, shit what am I going to do I can't make Butterball's face move at all he is frozen I might as well have a pillow strapped to my face so yeah so at least Nick could kind of move his a little bit because it's much thinner and he could do something with his teeth so all, all I ended up doing was I, I realised I could stick my tongue out if, uh, and even then it was like like the makeup's here so my tongue was like <laughs> I was going to ask <laughs> if they had given you a prosthetic tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, if they had, I'd probably still have it, actually. It would be quite useful. <laughs> but no, they didn't. <laughs> I've had prosthetic nipples. I had prosthetic nipples for uh, for Nightbreeze. Really? Uh, so, yeah, they were quite sexy. <laughs> you still have those? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. But I, did, um, I used to because... sell those, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I did learn to put them on myself because Nightbreeze, the, the guys, worked so hard with creating... Every day they were creating different prosthetic creatures every day, and the pressure on them was ridiculous. So, um, um, I learned how to stick on my own prosthetic nipples. <laughs> the reason yeah. I had to have them was there was a one scene where they pulled they uh, they pulled this metal out and ripped my nipple off, so I had to have prosthetic nipples. Well, I mean, that's a skill that'll last forever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, any anybody out there and the next convention, they'd like some nipple application. <laughs> I'm your man. Just come here. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> 
<laughs> in regards to the first two films, the Hellraiser films, which ones would you say presented more challenges when you were filming? Probably the second. Certainly, I, I suppose the first because we were finding our feet. The second because there was more happening. So there were scenes where there were rooms with chains that were kind of swinging wildly around, and we didn't know where they, and we didn't know where they were because we were. No, actually, the first, the first, because they expect there was stuff written in the scripts that the characters were supposed to do. For Nick, he, he had, putting his mouth into Ashley Lawrence. His, his fingers into her mouth and because we couldn't see we didn't know where the other actors were or what was happening or what was going on around us I had a scene where I was supposed to stab her boyfriend and as I went to stab him in the back in the back of his head a uh, uh, house fell down on top of me obviously I didn't know what I was doing where he was what was happening so they we kind of walked through it and they said so you, you'll walk forward till you feel the draft excluded with your feet at which point Steve will come in he will be directly in front of you so raise raise your knife that you're going to get hit him and then this big thing above me which was full of polystyrene bricks and dust and shit and stuff like that will fall on top of you and you just kind of disappear out of shots okay it seems seems straightforward before each shot they covered me in ky jelly because that's to get that kind of gloopy sweaty horrible stuff these days they have special material for that in hollywood but in, the, in those days they use ky jelly anyway so my head was ky jellied up and action so i kind of shuffled forward felt the thing with my foot went to raise the knife I thought when I feel this thing hit me, I'm going to collapse. I couldn't. I was like, come on. I'm going to hit you. I'll stop you. I'm going to on neck. Suddenly I heard cut. And there was like this swearing. I thought, what's going on? They literally dropped this big thing of polystyrene shits and bricks and everything on top of me. But because of the makeup and the costume, I couldn't feel it. You didn't feel it. feel it. Oh, my God. I didn't feel it at all. So I, I had no idea that they'd done it. But which point, all the shit in it was now stuck to the KY jelly all over my head. So I looked ridiculous. And I've got bits of brick on me. I've got dust. They use full as a which is a kind of dust stuck all over it so then with a lot of effing and blinding they took me away it took them an hour to clean the makeup off and then we went for it again and this time it was like doing a silent movie so they're saying okay you shuffle forward so i shuffle forward right you raise your knife (laughs) okay your house is falling on you now okay you're feeling that (laughs) so it was crazy it was crazy humiliating crazy in in number two they didn't ask us to they didn't ask us to do so much there was stuff happening around us but they realized our limitations i think so it was more there was just us turning or us moving forward or we had quite as much i did have one scene where i was being impaled right at the end top secret is that i had a i had a casting for a a sitcom the day that they uh that this happened and they released me to go and do this sitcom casting and so the person in the makeup was somebody completely different that day <laughs> I, I don't know who it was but yeah so the way where he gets impaled wasn't me would you say that your uh your makeup process was easier for you in the second movie did they make things a bit more fluid for I mean, you? they 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 tried to i i asked them if he was going because butterball had dark glasses and then his eyes were sewn up under the glasses which is why he was blind i was blind i asked them if he was going to take off his his dark glasses and they said no so i said well can I cut little holes in the makeup so at least I can see a little bit? Uh, I think each makeup was like thousands and thousands of pounds, which in those days was a lot. Anyway, I did it. And so I had a tiny, but all it really meant was that I had this, I could then kind of have this tiny tunnel vision. I could just see in front of me. And the moment we got on set, they put on the, in the gloomy set, and they put on the dark glasses anyway. I really couldn't see anything anyway, but then they expected me to be able to see. So the expectations of them, of me, were more, but actually it didn't really help me much. You just mentioned Nightbreed. Obviously, you didn't have quite as much makeup work in that movie. What were some of the challenges in that film that presented themselves? Yeah, I think no, I think Clive felt really sorry for me on it. <laughs> but also, uh, I had a lot of dialogue in Hellraiser, and when, when I had my first day speaking it, I couldn't say it because of the false teeth. So they took it all away and gave it to the... I think that was the day I broke down in my little makeup. So they took it away and gave it to the female Cenobite. So he felt really guilty, I think, about all of that. So I had no real kind of makeup. I had tattoos that they put on it each day but that was it was a joy so turning up at eight o'clock eating the fried breakfast that nobody else could eat (laughs) uh, seeing the sets talking to the other actors having the freedom to wander around it was a joy it was a joy the only thing is he did wasn't a huge amount of dialogue for my character and he was in a whole ton of scenes so it was kind of working out what I was going to do with him because it just said he is there 
and he has a dog, you know, and it, he was kind of um, Lylesburg, who again, Doug Bradley, he was his sidekick. So if, if Lylesburg was the kind of mayor of Midian, then he was, I don't know, the bookkeeper, I suppose, something like that. So I had to kind of make up my own kind of inner dialogue for what the character was thinking, which I kind of did. I, 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 it was the first time I really got to act, I think, because I really didn't get to act in, in the Horizon. I just thought to be. So it, it, it kind of worked. And what, what I was pleased about with that was that pretty much every shot I filmed was made it to the final cut. Yeah, no, it was a joy. It was a bit, I, I went to the gym. They sent us both, both to gym, me and Nick, to, to work out. And I managed to lose my little paunch, but uh, <laughs> it's still there a little bit. I didn't get that like ripped six pack that's expected these days. In fact, I'm going to die at the moment. I, I've done a film in nine days time. So yeah, I'm on a strict diet at the moment. You were just method adding. You were getting in the butterball phase, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just have a 60th 60 birthday. So I had a month's holiday, put on a freaking ton of weight. It was wonderful. Uh, <laughs> ate what I wanted, drank what I wanted. And now, and then, and then the end of it, I'm thinking, shit, I've got to lose all this now for this filming. What's the project Sorry. coming up? It's called Mosaic. It's an um, uh, anthology horror film. So lots of little films. And my character is the character who's trying to solve all these little films all these little murders horrific murders are all linked and my character in between each film is trying to work out what is going on why they're linked what is happening so I play uh, Detective Foley which is why I could be a rough beard I'm my head shaved again <laughs> yeah and they've asked me to not wear the glasses so that's kind of Detective Foley although I can't see <laughs> freaking thing I was going to say you I can't just... see again <laughs> yeah yeah just exactly exactly I hadn't thought <laughs> that it's true so uh, lots of bumping into the furniture <laughs> <laughs> Make him give Detective Foley a cane. Yeah. <laughs> Something dapper, well, you know? <laughs> I've already said they need to have somebody on set who just watches me because I've, I've done it before. You, you have a scene where you don't wear glasses or you wear different glasses and they say cut, you put your own glasses on, you go back to the script and you're looking at the script and you go, okay, and you put it down and they say action and off you go and you do it and you finish it. Oh, well, that went well. And you're, shit, I've got my glasses on. <laughs> you never, it's never, you know. <laughs> it, it doesn't endear you to people. Who's directing that movie? Is each segment being directed by a, a different person or is it just one director? It's two directors, Alex churchyard is one of them and i can't remember the other director's name which is terrible <laughs> <laughs> notes to self do your homework before you start, <laughs> start filming i've got a zoom call tomorrow with most of my scenes are with one actress who's a kind of young new recruit who's just come in who i'm showing the ropes and teaching her about all the cases so i've got my first meeting with her tomorrow by zoom and we're going to kind of talk th things through i've been we're learning it for ages they've done loads of rewrites so i've learned those and i've just been kind of trying some new stuff out trying some new techniques so i'm quite excited about actually it's going to be interesting to to see what happens where it goes i'm definitely going to be looking forward to that just jumping back to nightbreed for a second how many makeup artists were on that set it had to be an army of dudes oh. just out there there was a team I, I couldn't tell you how many but it was it was a lot and a lot of them were like sleeping sleeping there you know they were because of course for the makeup artists it's not just a case of putting it on and working then working all day and, and being on set to make sure it's it's still looking as good as it should be it's also taking it off quite often they will do it in shifts so so many will work on it and then others will be sent to set while the ones who worked from kind of four three four in the morning will try and get some sleep and then they'll swap over but then they've got it takes an hour or two to take it off because these days they stick it on with surgical super glue so it's just kind of case of peeling it back so that takes at least an hour and then and once they've done that, they have to clean everything, clean everything down, clean all the tools down. If they're going to use the makeups again, they, if they can, they've got to kind of clean those down. Well, that can be several hours work for them. So even though they have the, the, the actors who's perhaps finishing at eight, nine o'clock or leaving at nine o'clock at night, a lot of the times they didn't get time to go home. So they were, they were sleeping in the makeup room, maybe getting three hours sleep a night and then off they go again. And they were on it for months and months and months. It did have, it was in the Guinness Book of Records, Night Breeders, having more different monsters than any other film. I don't know if it still holds that record, but uh, yeah, there was a whole team of them. They were, they were incredible and they were, they were just having to think on their feet. I mean, there's a lovely one with a, a, a girl. She's, she's uh, naked from the uh, waist upwards, but she has like a hand 
on her chin. And you know, they were just kind of sticking things, trying what would work. I thought, that looks good. Yeah, we blend that in and we do this and do that. Maybe put a bell cup on her. Yeah, that works. Okay, do it. And then they go ahead and do it. It was wild. In fact, I met that with Jeff Portas and Roy Keane from Image Animation uh, a few weeks ago. One of their great things was that there was a big, there was the big god Baphomet in Nightbreed. Big black guy. And they, they made this incredible sculpture of him. And it was filled with fiber optics. So it did these incredible patterns. And Jeff had spent weeks and weeks and weeks. His hands were literally shredded by these fiber optics because they all had to be cut the nature of them it just shreds your hands but it looked amazing but in the final film in the back in that time of the 80s they did this like this optics that they would kind of add on they'd like kind of paint it on the film afterwards and you never saw any of these amazing fiber optics because they painted on this stuff afterwards i mean these days this doesn't look very good but it was kind of state of the art at the time um the fiber optics were lovely but it, all that work went for absolutely nothing yeah, so sadly it happens. On Harris, they had a, a jeweler who worked on set, and in, I had this belt. Clive's original idea was that the Butterwall was the, the torturer of the group and that he would torture the victims. So I had this belt that was filled with these incredible tools of torture, and the handles of them were absolutely beautiful, ornate pieces of jewelry, but you never see them in the film. They just went for nothing, which is a, a terrible shame. So have you seen all the different versions of Nightbreed? <laughs> I've seen the Cabal Cuts, and I've seen Clive's cuts so the director's cuts yes is that all of them <laughs> yeah there's the there's the theatrical then the directors yeah. and then the cabal of those yeah. which is your favorite i mean which which tells the, the best story the, the director's cuts definitely the, the original um story the short story cabal was beautiful absolutely beautiful book and really told the story from the point of view of the creatures of midian really kind of empathized with them and you really cared about these characters and then and i thought it was lovely and really moving and different and then the screenplay came out and when you read the screenplay you thought wow and there was a huge buzz at pinewood studios around the making of this film they reckoned it was going to be the new star wars for the fantasy genre Genre. they thought it was going to be enormous this film so it was a lot of excitement about it and the, the screenplay Clive's screenplay was just beautiful beautiful film then we started um, I don't know if you know and all this we started filming it and they had problems Morgan Creek who were funding it uh, there was a change in their executive producers and the guy who was behind it got who completely understood the concept that the monsters were the goodies and the humans were the baddies and it was about the persecution of minorities and there was lots more like in most of the Clive stuff there's lots of other stuff happening underneath the surface he completely got that completely understood it but the guy they brought in didn't he was kind of a more of a kind of standard horror guy and he was saying well no, but this is this is Clive Barker yeah this is a slasher film we need to make a slasher film not not this well people will never get that people won't understand he was quite insulting to the I think to the uh, to the horror fans and their intelligence so he so there was uh, friction happened and then they when we got we finished the film there was a little bit of problems with budget as well we went over budget then they went over to LA to edit it and there was more friction they sacked Clive's editor that he worked with on the first two heroes of films who he knew and trusted really well they brought uh, this executive producer brought in his own editor they had lots of fights I think about what it was and what it should be so when the theatrical version came out it wasn't at all what we were expecting there was no real time to get to know Laurie and Boone to kind of empathize with them to like them to go along this journey with them the the creatures were made to be more monstrous than we were hoping that they would be so but with Clive's what, what happened with the um theatrical version no the uh Clive's version drag cut was, a lot of that stuff was put back in so there was, there was time there was a scene where Laurie was crying there was a scene where she was singing you, you got to like her and they like to go on uh, both of them and they were the scene with the, the the rednecks kind of with all the other weapons and stuff and was it just made more sense it was closer to the version that we filmed it was it will never be what the version could have been but but also there, there were other stuff it wasn't just this director Clive always likes to push the boundaries the very opening sequence of, of Cabal the camera was kind of was doing this all over the place and it was moving around and there was these creatures dancing and the camera is kind of filming like that and these days 
you know, that happens a lot. You know, the camera doesn't stop still. It kind of, but in those days, you always had a camera on, on a crane or something. It was always very smooth. You never had jolting round images. So that was completely new. And, and, and I remember watching it on the big screen at Leicester Square when we went to the preview and thinking, what's this? This is weird. And it, yeah, people said, was the cameraman drunk? You know, did he have a problem? So it was pushing boundaries, which I don't, I don't know. And, and great, they need to be pushed. But for its time, it was quite revolutionary and new. And also a lot of the scenes, Clive wanted the whole idea of Midian being more of a fantasy. So more almost halfway between a cartoon. So when you get to Midian, a lot of the shots and a lot of the, the backgrounds look almost painted. They don't look real. And there's quite a clash between reality and Midian, which looks slightly painted, which again, I, I, I understand where he's coming from, but it's a kind of dangerous. It's a clever game. It's a, when you get that, okay, you, you, you can work with it. You understand. But at the time I thought, oh, that's odd. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it had problems which is a shame it's a shame i think it would have been huge had a lot of that been ironed out how did clive react to all the changes that were being made initially i think it almost killed him to be honest from somebody who'd been very much in control of being a writer so you write you get everything out on the page you give it to an editor they give you notes you write again, you get it back, but it's very much, you are very much in control of the genre of writing. To being with something where it's a team effort, everybody's working together. He enjoys that as well, in the same way that you would work in theatre. But then for somebody to come in at the end of all of that, and to be able to take his his work and his his writing, his creativity, his vision, and just cut out sections and put other bits together and make it work in a way that he never envisaged, I think really distressed him. And that whole experience didn't, was the reason that he's never really gone back into directing since, which is such a shame because he's a joy to work with. He's a, he's a, he's an amazing man. He was drained. He was, he, he lost a lot of weight. It was an experience. Terrible. Yeah. He didn't enjoy at all, which is, and now he, he does a lot of painting again, because he's completely in control of it. He obviously carries on with the writing. So yeah, I still see Clive. I still go over there. Well, I did before COVID. I still went over there every year or so i'm hoping to get back next year speaking of being in control have you talked to him since he reclaimed the rights to the hellraiser franchise no no i haven't it's interesting isn't it i, I, I want to see where he goes i don't know where it's gonna go there's so many rumors around one of the big studios had got was kind of interested in doing something with him there was talk of a project with nightbreed a tv series there was another project you know penny dreadful mm -hmm. so there was a project which was muted that i was approached for and nick was and ashley and doug i think called the harrowers and it was basically a mixture of all clive's world so there were cenobites in it there were creatures from midian in it there were creatures there was a big carpet in it there was ashley lawrence's character from the hellraiser she was in it but all these worlds were mixed into one great big fantasy there were characters from imagica his his children's books so all these characters from all these different worlds were in this one world it was really fascinating and i understand mgm were um, tv were interested in that yeah i was gone quiet for a, a, a year or a few years so who knows we talked about butterball and nightbreed but i just recently watched the fright night documentary oh, yeah. that, that's one of my favorite roles of yours <laughs> is peter the great how did i can the great vampire <laughs> you killing me right now it's perfect <laughs> it was so great did you did they approach you for that? Is that something you volunteered for? Are you a fan? Yes. Of the, uh, the, the, the company that made that, they were horror fans and they decided that they wanted to make a horror documentary about the Hellraiser films. So they came to one of the conventions we did in Birmingham here in the UK, approached us and we said, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And so I got to know them. They asked tons of questions. We got on really well. And then they said, they approached me I don't know, a few months later. I said, well, our next, they made them, that, that, that documentary was called Leviathan which was kind of aptly known because it was seven hours long <laughs> seven hours the most uh, i don't know amazing documentary but they said the next one we're going to do is is fright night and as as a kind of device we'd like the character of peter vincent that was played by roddy mcdowell to narrate all the links in the documentary we're going to write some stuff we said we've got they said we've got roddy mcdowell's life mask from that somebody had over in in hollywood that we're having flown over we're trying to think of somebody who has a similar facial structure to roddy mcdowell who it will fit 
and we were thinking of you. Would you be interested in, in doing this? And I thought, wow, yeah, that, that, would be, that would be something worth trying. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. They kind of announced it almost instantly, like that weekend. And I went online and suddenly the internet was full of people going, oh, so Simon Bamford's going to be playing Ruddy McBell. That'd be interesting. And Peter Vincent as well. So we'll see what he's like. Can he do that? Can he actually do this? Can he get away with it? I was like, shit. The pressure instantly. So I went from, oh, this is fun. This is going to be fun to, oh, oh, my God. And Roddy McDowell and Peter Vincent and Fright Night are such loved films and, uh, and people that I suddenly felt a huge responsibility to them. And I, not everybody has reacted as kindly as you have. But, but to them, I say, I'm not playing Roddy McDowell. I'm not saying playing Peter Vincent, the person that Roddy McDowell plays in the films. Who I'm playing is Roddy McDowell playing Peter Vincent, playing the his TV personality, which yeah, you're was... you're the, the host, the vampire yeah. killer. So it's kind of a character on top of a character on top of a character, and go. <laughs> so, so that's why he's kind of a little bit more over the top. But I studied him, I studied Roddy, I studied the, the films, and I realised that he had amazing diction. And Roddy McDowell very much came from the Hollywood school of actors, where they would take an actor, they would work with them, they would teach them loads about film technique about camera technique and his diction was absolutely beautiful absolutely wonderful and so I tried to kind of work on that and then just have fun and then they sent me the scripts which some of them were ridiculously long long monologues of dialogue some of which had no emotional content so it would be saying well such and such a film director was working with and an another group of names who were uh, special effects artists or as uh, it was lots and lots of facts and figures and and then you think oh my goodness i'm gonna learn all of this but i did it was fun it was so much fun to play and the more we did it the more i kind of relaxed with it and got into it and realized it was going to work and and also when when you have somebody else's face put onto yours so i had his prosthetics which was i think a nose piece a nose piece a chin piece and then kind of uh, makeup and obviously the wig so they may be and you look in the mirror and you see somebody looking back at you that is a different person it's incredibly liberating and it kind of frees you because we are all self-judgmental we all look in the mirror or look in the monitor like I'm occasionally doing now and, and go, <laughs> oh, you know, don't do that because you don't look so good doing that. But when it's somebody else... Is that what I look like? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, is this worse? Is this what I sound like? When it's somebody else looking back, you don't have that. You don't care. It's somebody else. So that that is very liberating as well. I've had that experience a few times now. And, and Stuart Conran, prosthetic makeup artist, who is also on Hellraiser and Nightbreed. I've worked with him on many, many films now, and he's created lots and lots of faces and characters for me. I, I love working with him. He, and he created the uh, the Mrs. Wilkeshire. I don't know if you're aware of the Dark Ditties films, but he created the old lady, Mrs. Wilkeshire, which, which again, was great. And who I'm revisiting in episode six, which we're filming in a few months' time. I haven't really looked at the script yet, so I'm concentrating on this other one. But Mrs. Wilkeshire is coming back, but as a younger version. So, yeah, playing a, a woman. So do you you prefer long form film or do you like the anthology style better it's a good question well um the dark ditties are interesting in that they're each episode is a completely different story but they are feature length episodes and in fact in episode six it kind of tied the winch we we're about to film they, it ties all of them up and you can see why they're all connected they are actually inhabiting the same world even though each one is completely different so that that's quite exciting when you get the script because you go, oh, oh, there's that character. And for, for us as actors, because they've kind of got a rep of actors together, we get to play all these completely different characters that casting directors wouldn't necessarily cast you. And they certainly would never cast me as a nice to a woman or necessarily as a creepy groundsman or uh, all sorts of as, a, as an investment banker. So you get to we, we all get to, to the chance to try something completely different. And that's again, that's very liberating. I'm not sure playing a woman. I wasn't sure we could ever get away with that, but I think we kind of do. But uh, uh, because she was old, when you look at an old person, you don't look at them in any way. Sorry, old people, but you don't look at them in a sexual way. So you're you're not looking for those little things. You just accept them. Sadly, we kind of stand back from old people. We don't we're not as interested in them as a society, which is wrong. So uh, but you're not looking for those little details, giveaway details. So as an old woman, people aren't looking at those. So you can get away with a little bit more. And I, I think she were lovely as well. I thought she were a lovely lady and so gentle, you know. 
just love but now she's in her 50s so i'm, I'm oh, freaking I, I would die if it looked like a man in drag you know it would, be, it would be so so wrong i think the less we see of her the better so more kind of hand shots or back of the head shots or and so when you do finally see her you don't see her for often very long and then we maybe we'll get away she's not in the film for that much she is in it and i also get to play a, a nazi a nazi uh, abortionist lovely fun role <laughs> I'm still struggling that any Fright Night fan would be troubled by your portrayal of Peter Vincent. This is bothering well, me. Well, <laughs> you know, some people say it was a bit over the top. Well, yeah, it was supposed to be fun, you know? I mean, deep but, down, the Peter Vincent, the character, he was a hack. So, yeah. I mean, the well, bigger and, and, and you know, more, oh, you can make it, the better. Yeah, yeah. I, one of the interesting things about running it, Roddy, he would start each film, he would say to the cast and crew and the directors, I have a habit to go a little bit hammy with my, to do a little bit too much you must stop me if I do that and I think what he did for Peter Vincent not Peter Vincent the person but Peter Vincent playing the TV host was allow that bit of ham to come out which must have been quite liberating for him <laughs> certainly that's what I felt he was doing oh, absolutely. and that's what I was doing and I was perhaps taking that ham a little bit too a little bit further than he, he was allowed to. But then it's not Fright Night. It is Fright Night, the documentary. So I, I look, I'm quite proud of it, actually. I look back at some of the, the thought processes that the character's going through and think, yeah, that worked. We improvised some stuff as well, which was fun. And I, I wouldn't tell the crew what I was going to do. So I was kind of entertaining them at the same time. I would love to see some of those shorts made into full-length Peter Vincent films. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, Tom Holland was actually talking about not that, Tom Holland, the other Tom Holland, the director Tom Holland, was talking about doing a, a Friday Night 3. And uh, I, I I did say, well, I'm available. <laughs> you do, you do, you do, uh, Peter Vincent. Please did you tell. see the did you see the remake with uh, David Tennant and um I haven't. Have you not yet? Yes, I have. What'd you think of it? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> that's the reaction that's, I get from everybody. That's the consensus. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we actually talked talk to Jonathan Stark recently, who played Billy Cole in Fright Night, and he feels they really just sort of tore down the character of Peter Vincent and made him less likable. But I haven't seen yeah. it. I can't, I can't say. Yeah, they did. <laughs> <laughs> so, Simon, to date, what would you say is the best acting advice that you've received? Ooh, do less, think, don't act. It's acting advice that I still have to tell myself all the time. I've, I've, there's a film about to come out. Um, in fact, part five of the Dark Digits season has been delayed because of COVID. It's the most exciting one of the ones we've done. It's a zombie apocalypse movie set in the future. And I have a horrible feeling that my acting shows in it. And uh, there was one scene especially at the end which is oh, I've seen little clips and I'm thinking oh it looks terribly melodramatic I'm hoping once the scores around it and they're kind of the story you're involved in the story that it doesn't seem quite as, as hammy so yeah and in fact I've got quite a dramatic scene at the end of Mosaic which we're filming in nine days where stuff happens and already going note to self do less do less okay it's a big dramatic scene there's lots going on physically but do less do less so yeah do less that was the best advice do less have you seen any good horror movies during the lockdown Ooh, yeah loads the most recent i saw was run which you call that a horror movie i've never heard of that one certainly suspense i think it is a horror movie have you seen run i'm not familiar <sighs> with it. now you're gonna ask me about it and somebody asked me about it earlier today and i couldn't remember that so tell me the name i'm terrible at names of the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful actress who is in all the American horror stories. Sarah Paulson. Uh, Sarah Paulson. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Angelique. I've been searching for her name all day. Wonderful actress. It's on Netflix. It's called Run. It's about a oh, disabled... Yeah, I, just, yeah, I just added this to my list. Yes, I want to watch this. It's about a disabled girl who starts to suspect there's something odd might be going on with her mother something sinister beautifully structured in that clive used to say if you want to take an audience on a journey you have to start in reality and then slowly very slowly spiral into but they have to be start in something that's really real and he was i think a bit of a master on that and if you think of hellraiser you're asking an audience to believe that this woman is so in love with this chap who's come back from the dead he's like a zombie that she's going to go out and hammer people over the head so you're asking them to go on quite a leap of faith with you but it starts in something that we can all relate to and uh the character's quite unpleasant and uh, and there's family tension there but it's stuff that we all 
relate to. And they do that with run. It starts somewhere where you completely like the people, you completely believe in them, you care in them. And then the little bits of doubt that creep in, you go along the journey and, and then, then the journey gets kind of bigger and bigger and bigger and then slaps you on the face. Yeah, run. I really enjoyed that. I'm going to have to check that out. But tell me once you've yeah. seen and I'll tell you if I've seen them. What, what have you seen recently? Or? Have you seen The Wretched? No. That's a good okay. one to Host check out. Host is very good. Which one? Host. Host, okay. Yeah, it was released kind of at the beginning of quarantine last year. It's all done on Zoom. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, cool. it's amazing. It's really amazing. I enjoy that I, one, too. I did something, and Doug, I see, has done something with the same guys on Zoom, my first ever Zoom film called 14 Ghosts, which was with a company over in uh, L.A. that contacted me and said, we'd like you to, finally, with the same background, with, uh, we'd like you to play this character of an art gallery dealer whose ghosts are taking over his art gallery, and he's doing this Zoom, Zoom call in and this like the pictures are flying around him and stuff and so yeah i, I did my cool. i zoomed in my los angeles hollywood film <laughs> performance from <laughs> here on my little house in the countryside in the uk oh, it was quite fun actually is that out now i don't if you it's look not, at IMDb, it says yes but i don't think it is yet it's I not seen it. it's not released released yet but it's right. coming very shortly i'm following it on imdb pro because i love 13 ghosts and i saw the right. title 14 ghosts pop up and i was like you know what yeah we're gonna we like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it's going to be like. Here you go. Angelique, do you have anything else for Simon before we well, cut? Well, I hate to ask you because you're on a strict diet to get ready for your, your shoot in a few uh, days. I love thinking about food. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my question that I like to ask everybody is, what's your favorite movie snack? Like, what's that one thing that just helps you create the perfect movie-watching experience? So I really like, like, caramelized popcorn. And I've got a really sweet tooth. I, ice cream, any ice cream, salted caramel, and I know it's big in the UK, and they're big over there as well. So, like, a salted caramel. We have a, this ice cream over here, which is like a, a white. It's called a Magnum. I don't know if you have Magnum. Yes. 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 Double caramel, caramel is my favorite. <laughs> oh. Oh. So yeah, a good ice cream. Oh, awesome. I'm jealous of your of your your access to all the Cadburys over there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love yeah. a I love a crunchy. That's my favorite. My sister came around recently. We had um we postponed Christmas Day because we couldn't get together as a family. I've got quite a big family. I've got a big garden. So and I couldn't really afford it to be honest. So I I said, look, let's all get together exactly six months after christmas and we'll have a postponed christmas day so we had 25th of june which was a week and a half ago we all my family came around we all went into the garden we had turkey burgers with cranberry mayonnaise and we had christmas pudding ice cream we had um we had all the presents we dressed up in santa claus outfits and it was great fun and my sister turned out but all the foods like the turkey burgers and everything else was still part of my diet more or less yeah, well so, yeah, technicalities work <laughs> yeah um, but then she turned up and she said and for christmas i bought you this huge box of chocolates i was like oh no <laughs> so I tried, to, I managed to resist it for about three days and then I started eating like one or two and then that was like five. And then I thought, this is crazy. I've just, I've just got to finish the whole box of chocolates. So I just sat there and ate all of it in one go. And I thought, right now I'm back on the diet to a point where you feel sick, you know, and Lindor, you have Lindor over there, I think. Yes. Oh, those are I so good. It. All right. So Lindor. we have our, I have a chocolate buddy to talk chocolate with. <laughs> Oh, cool. <laughs> Do you have Hotel Chocolat over there? I don't think so. We've got, we you know, Ghirardelli and, and things like the main ones, you know, Nestle. We, we have this, this chain store called Hotel Chocolat, and it's all really kind of expensive chocolate. Mm -hmm. And um, they do wonderful stuff with cream in it. Um, but they also do this, uh, they call it a velvetizer. So there's a machine you can buy from them. And then you buy, funnily enough, you buy the sachets of this special chocolate that you put into the machine with the milk. And it kind of whisks it all up and heats it all up and froths it all up, all in the same thing, and then makes these amazing hot chocolates. So. But oh it's one my. for the winter. And yeah. certainly not for now. I you know what great. I'll be searching for when we get done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, velvetizer. Well, Simon, we're not going to keep you all evening, but I suppose to wrap up here, tell folks what else you have on the horizon. So, so the next one coming out, I think, will be Dad, which is part, uh, part five of Dark Ditties, um, part 
one to four of Doctors is available on Amazon Prime at the moment uh, in the UK and in the USA, but nowhere else, I don't think. So after that, I did a film just before lockdown called You Are My Sunshine, which is a kind of coming of age kind of LGBT film that's due out sometime soon. Then there's, gosh, what else? There's so much. Then, then there's The 14 Ghosts that's due out. Gosh, I'm going to forget. I filmed a few things and they, like, they've just been put back. Uh, I've got Mosaic, which we're about to film, and Dad Stained Part 6 of Dark Ditties, which we're about to film both before the end of this year, so they'll be out next year. Yeah, I think I think that's everything. <laughs> Sorry if I've forgotten somebody. Oh, it's good that you've been busy. Yeah, no, we'd yeah. love to hear it. Yeah, I've done a few voiceovers for things as well. I, 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 I can't, oh, yes, so I did a voiceover for something I can't remember. So that will probably be coming out too. Simon, it's been a pleasure talking to you, my friend. Uh, I'll make sure to send you this. And Justine, we'll Angelique, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Have a great Cheers, rest of your you evening. Too. Cheers. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.